Clean day, that's for sure. I heard that. We're thankful for this day that you've given us for blessings, for opportunities, and challenges. And we appreciate you each day that comes to us. We pray for strength, for guidance, for each day that comes, for each day of duty, for each day of problems. May we be challenged to give our best always, and may we be sure you're present with us. Amen. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is the truth, is the fair, all concerned, will build goodwill and better friendships, will be beneficial to all concerned. Rick, how's the birthday situation this week? Well, I'll tell you what, sir, well, we have a short report. <laughs> uh, we have uh, some anniversaries in a somewhere. We're there. Yeah. Uh, it's, how many years have you been around this place? It is seven years. We appreciate your support too, man. Really do. And then we got a couple of birthdays here. However, we do have a wedding that we did yesterday. This is as well. And you know, he ends up with having no, actually, Mark and Mom. And I did not forget 20 years. All right. We're actually celebrating right here tomorrow night. Oh, are you ready? He's waving. He's on Zoom. I don't know how long he's got to recover, but it sounded like a pretty good He's pretty good contact, and uh, yeah, I think he's got him a long way to run. So we do well to send his regards and send him a prayer. All right. I'm going to go to this edition of the hospital today. He's in the bunkhouse with us, with us, and family. It's pretty easy. I use the valet parking, tip the bucket nicely, but there's no charge at the hospital. He's going to land in us. Uh, the uh, five, four and a half to six weeks, somewhere in there, for us to be able to stand again on the time. And we're hoping to take him home next week. Uh, his mom and dad have to go to the training and they're trying to see if the wheelchair is going to be lifted out. Two broken wrists and severely damaged legs. Uh, he should have a full recovery. He's a young guy, strong guy. I understand he, there's somewhere around here, he's trying to really break deal on the slightly damaged motorcycle. <laughs> He's going to be okay. It's rough, rough with it. Right. I'll skip back to Glenn. He's here this morning. Yeah. We have to split between the paper and the laptop today. So we, have to we do have a few guests today. Uh, Don Van Kemp, who has said that I'm on the phone. Mike Campbell, visiting the chair. Where's Mike? Okay. We've been talking a lot through email. Okay. And he's with Reading Connections. And I believe he's going to present next week. Yes. So he's new to Greensboro. He's the president of Winston Salem. Yeah, the Winston Salem Downtown Club. Okay. So he just wanted to come and visit our club and meet some people in Greensboro. And I told him to come on. And then it turns out, since he does reading connections, I thought he'd be a good presenter too. So you'll see him for a couple of weeks now. So, uh, Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about the fundraiser? Before we do happy dog? Sure. Um, I tried to pull my thoughts together last night uh, about this fundraiser. Uh, I've confessed to a lot of you that I have no experience with fundraising in the past. <laughs> I've spent most of my life uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, asking people for money despite a number of financial uh, downturns here and there. Um, in some I try to avoid. Um, I'm asking all of you this year 
to open up your wallets um, wide. I'm asking for it. We're going to be asking for sponsorships, raffle prizes, door prizes, etc. Um, when I'm in this room, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, because if, if you've gotten up at 7 a.m. And, and gotten it together, you're here for more than biscuits and gravy, I know. <laughs> uh, you understand the importance of rotary and your own role in public service. You're no stranger to the giving. Um, and uh, here's, I was looking last night, trying to get a little bit of inspiration, because fundraising is, of course, about giving. Um, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give from Winston Churchill. No one's ever become poor by giving on from. It's every man's obligation to put back in the world at least the equivalent of what he takes out of it. Albert Einstein. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. Pablo Picasso. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And then our favorite was uh, giving of ourselves, sharing our gift is what lifts us. The tricky part is none of us knows exactly how we will impart the gift we have to give. Which kind word we speak, which song we sing, which hug we give will be the one that touches another soul. We're living in trying times with lost so much faith in each other. Sadly, over the last year, our own club has lost several members who were in the past financially generous, not just for the annual fundraiser, but throughout the year. We in this room are fortunate to be alive and well during a pandemic. I intend to reach out to each of you by phone or otherwise this next week or so and ask for not only a repeat of your giving from last year, but a percentage over. I'll ask you not only to give, to give more, but to invite others to join us at what will be one hell of a party on May 7th. I'll ask for money, sponsorship, raffle items, door prizes, and we'll certainly welcome any insights as to how to make our fundraiser an extraordinary and elevating event. I personally have been hesitant to approach the gate of this fundraising race, but now that I stand here at the start of the Derby, I'm becoming excited. The year we're teaming up with uh, this year, we're teaming up with the folks from the Out of the Garden Project, and I believe Christy Milholland is with us this morning. Uh, we chose Out of the Garden Project as an important player and fundraiser beneficiary this year because of their intrinsic, ever-giving role within our community. During a time when so many, unlike ourselves, have endured hardships in the best and the worst of times. Please, all of you, really. As you leave this bountiful breakfast, think of why you join Rotary and show the world <laughs> what it means not just to be a Rotarian, but to be a big city Rotarian. Help me out this year, guys. We're going to have a technical party. <laughs> It comes together. Unfortunately, my daughter graduated from the University of Kentucky that weekend. I think we're going to be at the first. But she kind of has to go to it. So that's one of the last things we'll do. We're bringing her back. Maybe she'll go to work in Florida or something. I don't know if she's coming home or not. But anyway, so looking forward to the, to the party and seeing all of it. Uh, hey, Tom, we got another happy dollar from online. Happy dollars? Are we doing happy dollars? Yeah. That's what we're doing, doing, right? I was going to ask yeah. Mark, did we finish the football tour? <coughs> yeah, football sort of fancy football tour. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a good year. I did have some fun. I, I, can, uh, I can create some sophisticated stuff. So, <laughs> so I, I think we're coming to that. Okay. Well, Bobby, I was going to do happy dollars. I didn't forget yeah. it. It's on the happy dollars. <laughs> You made a good list, or you can give the sermon on the amount. Happy dollars. Okay, well, Mark. Uh, two simple words. George Bullock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not losing it all. I guess I could say yes. Oh, shit. Always. 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 Oh, 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 First off, I want to thank a lot of for uh, letting me present last week. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, 
<laughs> and I want to thank Steve for sort of setting the stage about this giving thing. Uh, during gratitude, we need about 20, 25 more volunteers to make a uh, round of 150 volunteers. We need 15 more veterans that we would like to honor. Any veteran, wounded or not, can come out. And um, so we're working hard, but we are short of about $30,000 in cash. So we got uh, we're one month out uh, as of yesterday. Uh, and so we appreciate your help. We really need the volunteers. We'll find them up. It's not hard to get money for veterans uh, if you want to give. And in the spirit of giving, I'll just tell you this you'll not spend a better day uh, in the field with a bunch of veterans. And I want to thank particularly Dr. Bondo. Uh, a bunch of, I know that, but I mean, a bunch of folks in here have already pledged to be sponsors to give or have uh, signed up. A couple of new people this year. Come on out and you'll have a fantastic day. I wanted to say we have at least a handful of volunteers going out from our club. So don't, you know, if anybody needs, wants to volunteer, I know Walt said he was, I am Matt, he was. There's probably some people I signed up. Else. No. So we'll have a good group. To, to hang out with. It's not like you'd be lonely, so it'll be a fun time. There's no stranger there. No, and the, the people that we help are awesome people. I mean, these are good people. Salt of the earth, risk their lives to protect all of us. So, so we're yes. worthy call. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Chip, what's the date on that again? February 12th. It starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. It will be cold. <laughs> <laughs> Brian! That's a quick recovery. Uh, well, I do want to give two updates real quick. Um, one on the Chick fil A front. Uh, I hope this is an excused absence, but December 2nd, went down to Atlanta, right in Bell, have been officially selected as an operator uh, of Chick fil A. So, after a two and a half year interview process, uh, we'll be taking over March 1st over four seasons. Um, so, <laughs> miss the next few weeks because of being in Atlanta uh, for training and then. Uh, back in February but yeah the uh last 10 days I see Chris sitting in that bed man and uh I just learned the hard way that uh control is a facade to go from a Sunday with the family best weekend we've had in so long to double over puking blood in the emergency department Monday morning uh thankfully if you want to get seen in the emergency department go puke at the front desk <laughs> very quickly <laughs> Nurses and doctors at home just, I know the healthcare system gets ragged on a lot, but oh my gosh, they're saints. And there's a reason why that same day, per the nurses kind of coaching, said mobility is your friend. And so from surgery that morning to walking that evening, very slowly and with help, but for them to say, hey man, we want to get you recovered and get you, uh, you know, up and at it. So thank you to the nurses and doctors. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Hassel, it's been a great first uh, four months or so for our great Stanley Tanger Center for the Performing Arts downtown. Some of you may remember I was fortunate to have been part of the original task force when we put that idea together uh, over a decade ago. Um, because of the delay in the opening from COVID, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, some of the programming has been delayed. Uh, but one of the great performances that is coming up just this month um, was the delayed and deferred but wonderful production of Greensboro Opera's Porgy and Bess, uh, starring Greensboro's own Rhiannon Giddens, in addition to another uh, bunch of stars from the Metropolitan Opera and from literally all around the country. And uh, it's going to be a wonderful production. In addition to the stars and, and the great people you, you will see, um, briefly in the second act, um, you may see and hear someone else you, you may have seen on stage over the years uh, in a non-singing part. But uh, that being said, it, it will be a, a wonderful production. Tickets are scarce uh, for a good reason, and it's uh, it will be a proud weekend for Greensboro uh, next weekend, the 21st and 23rd. Hope some of you can make it. So. All right. Thank you. I got one Bobby online. Yeah. All right. So I couldn't get audio to work this morning. So Chris, uh, he's going to Venmo you. You say he's very grateful that he wasn't more seriously injured. Uh, glad to have another chance at life and appreciate the support from everyone in Rotary. I'll be back in April. <clears throat> By the way, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, uh, thanks to Chip for bringing me Chick-fil-A and for Steve visiting me later today. Glad to be a Rotarian. Wow. Great. Or, well, Grandpappy married 
71 years, he told me that the secret to a long, happy marriage is to admit when you're wrong and shut up when you're right. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby, and, and the line Anybody of marriage. Anything from the club? I believe I've covered everything. So we're going to introduce the speaker, Kevin Reiner. I've been uh, corresponding on email for about a month and a half with him. And he has all these very interesting programs he does. And he's retired from the United States Air Force as a colonel. He grew up in Long Island, got a degree from Delphi University. Then he was commissioned into the Air Force in 1977, where he worked with fighter aircraft. And he was a big public affairs person for the Air Force and commanded 74,000 member organization. He came to Greensboro in 2005 and he, has, he worked for Brooks Group as a trainer and, then, and was still an advisor to the Air Force. Uh, his wife, Jean, also was in the Air Force as a nurse. And he has a son in the Air Force, Philip, and a daughter who's a nurse in Cone. Uh, he's on Star Mount Sport of Directors. He likes to play golf. And, he didn't travel and he likes fantasy baseball. But he's, I had to pick one of these stories. He gives me a list of them. And one of them was a Christmas thing about George Washington. Well, we'd already booked all the Christmas meetings, so maybe we can have him back for that. But I'm really looking forward to this presentation. So, Kevin, it's all yours. I made it eight to 30 minutes. So looking forward to it. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today. I really do appreciate the opportunity. I'm a member of the Kiwanis Club, and I know that community service is, is very important to a lot of people. So uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity. All right. One second. There we go. Okay. All right. You know, you don't have to be a history professor or a history or even a history buff to have heard of some of the great battles of World War II in the Pacific. There's the battles of Iwo Jima, Okinawa. Midway. In Europe, there's the Battle of Britain, the Normandy invasion, the Battle of the Bulge. But I'm not going to talk about those battles. There's been plenty of books written about them. You've seen movies about them. What I'm going to talk to you about today is what I consider the strangest battle of World War II. Now, why is it the strangest battle? Because German and US soldiers actually fought on the same side during one battle in World War II, believe it or not, on the same <clears throat> side. Now, it's the battle for Castle Ida in 1945. Anybody ever heard of this battle? No, but it's a very interesting one. Here are the unlikely allies. On the left, we have Lieutenant John Jack Lee, 27 year old college football star from New York. On the right, Major Joseph Sepp Gangle. He's a member of the German Wehrmacht Army, the professional army of Germany. He's in his mid thirties. In the 1930s, during the depression, the best opportunity he had was to join the army. He has served very bravely during World War II. He has fought in Africa. He has fought on the Eastern Front against the Soviets, but he has become disillusioned by what Hitler has done to Europe and what it has done to his country. So he manages to work an administrative assignment back in Austria. And while he's back there, he joins the Austrian resistance and is providing intelligence to the allies. Castle Ida is located in the western part of Austria, not too far from the German border at the base of the Alps. It has a long history. It started being built in the ninth century. And over the years, they added on to the castle. And it served a lot of different purposes. It started out as a Bavarian fortress. Okay. It was for defense in the area. The Catholic Church took it over. It was an ecclesiastical court. They used to collect taxes there. It was a hotel for travelers. A music conservatory. Some of the great composers of Europe used to go there to relax, write music, take a break, study, things like that. It was a private residence for a while. It even became an events venue. You could have weddings there, anniversary parties, birthday parties, whatever you wanted. They rented it out. Eventually, it became a Nazi political prison. Now, how did it go from being a fairy tale castle out of Disney, Disney type atmosphere to a prison? Well, in 1940, Hermann Himmler, the uh, 
second in command of the Nazi government, or Heinrich Himmler, excuse me, he decides to lease the castle for unspecified use. Some people thought maybe he was going to live there after the war when Germany won. So he was, he was uh, renting it out, so to speak. But in 1943, there's a little bit of a change. Himmler orders the castle to become an evacuation camp for VIP prisoners. And it's going to be under the control of the Dachau concentration camp. Now, what are VIP prisoners? Well, when France was overrun in the space of about two months and Germany took over, they took many of the uh, key people in the French government and said, you know, we're not going to kill them. We're going to actually take care of them because when we win the war, these people will be very useful in keeping the French people quiet. So they've got to fix the castle up to turn it into a prison. So they bring in slave laborers from some of uh, the Eastern uh, concentration camps. And they've got to build prison cells. They've got to build office space. They've got to build a dining hall, all those kind of things, for places for the, the guards to live. So when they finish building the castle into a prison, all of the tradesmen except one are sent back to their concentration camps. <clears throat> one person who stays is Zvonimir Kukovich. He's an electrician from Croatia. And he will be the maintenance man. And he keeps a secret notebook of everything that is going on in the castle, which is where I get a lot of my information from. Now, if you've got a prison, you've got to have guards, right? So the Nazis decide they will take some people from Dachau, the concentration camp. And the guy in charge is a Captain Sebastian Wimmer. He's a member of the German SS. They are the fanatics in the, in the Nazi government. These are the people that, that run the death camps. They have no value for life at all if you're not part of the German plan, okay? This guy, Wimmer, when the German army would advance and there were people left behind in the local towns, he just went and killed them, especially anti-Nazi clergy, uh, prisoners of war, things like that. His second in command is Lieutenant Otto Stefan. He's the intelligence officer. His job is to interrogate the prisoners. Well, you gotta have some guards. Well, they're not gonna take combat age men to be the guards, so they get a bunch of older men who are beyond normal combat age. And there's one woman there as a member of the auxiliary, probably an administrative type position. So on Sunday, May 2nd, 1943, the first prisoners arrive. Kukovic, the trade looks out the window. He sees two Mercedes staff cars pull up and he recognizes the people that get out of the cars. Why? Because their pictures have been all over the newspapers in Europe for years. The first person to arrive is the former prime minister of France, Edouard Dallier, the former chief general of the army, that would be like the chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff, right? Gamelin. And a left-wing labor leader by the name of Leon Giroux. They're the first to arrive. But over the next two years, there's a whole list of key people from the French government that arrive. Another former prime minister. He's there with his mistress. Jean Baratra. This is an interesting guy. He's France's greatest tennis player. He's also a member of the French army and he's a political activist. Another former chief general of the army, a fellow by the name of Maxime Wigan. The sister of uh, Maria Calio is the sister of Charles de Gaulle. Above that, Francois de Larocque is a political leader. Michel Clemenceau, he's the son of the World War I prime minister, uh, George Clemenceau, and Augusta Brooklyn, the female companion of Leon Jero. Most of these folks are older, except for Baratra. Now, prison life here has a good side. For example, the prisoner is assigned rooms. They're not given cells. And the guards have said, don't use the term cell, use the term room. Now, they get three meals a day in a ground floor dining hall. If they like, they can go back to their room and eat. Or if the weather's nice, they can eat outside on the back patio. Not a bad deal. They get generous wine rations to keep them happy. You know how much the French like on their wine. They even get money to buy tobacco and other sundries. They can send and receive mail. They have access to a library and they can listen to Radio Berlin. 
I don't know why they'd want to listen to Radio Berlin. It's all propaganda for the German government. They can exercise in the backyard. Remember Francois Baratra, the tennis player. It's very important. He keeps himself in shape. They can even attend mass at a local church. And if you're a female prisoner, you can go visit the local hairdresser. And they get excellent medical care. Not bad for a prison, huh? Well, there is a bad side to prison, okay? Prisoners are told, you must remember you are under the absolute control of the Third Reich. You must obey all orders immediately. You're going to be locked in your room from 11 p.m. to 7 o'clock in the morning. And if you leave the castle without an escort, you could be shot on sight. Well, you know, even though prison life isn't too bad there, prisoners don't always comply. For example, Kukovic, the tradesman, He's still technically a prisoner there. He's not allowed to come and go as he pleases. He manages to steal a shortwave radio from one of the guards. The guard can't report it. Why not? Because he's not supposed to have the radio. So he gives the radio to the former prime minister, Renault, and he's in his room listening to the BBC. And he's sharing the information with everybody, even his fellow captives. The interesting thing is what I read about was these people in the French government, they were such political enemies with each other. They wouldn't eat lunch or meals with each other. They wouldn't talk to each other. They would get into fights with each other sometimes. I mean, think about it. The enemy is the Nazis, but they're fighting between themselves. But, oh, right. Baratra, the tennis star, he does try to escape three times. He gets caught three times, but they don't shoot him. Okay? He's only given house arrest for a few days each time. Okay, spring of 1945, the Wehrmacht army is collapsing. It's retreated back into Germany. There's really not an organized professional army unit left in the field. It's only a matter of time. Hitler has been dead for five days now. The war is basically over. Now, if you're a soldier in the field on either side and you know the war is gonna end any day, what's your biggest concern? Staying alive, okay? Let me just finish these out and then I can go home, all right? So, technology break and works. All right, now, the Allies hear rumors that the German SS, those fanatics, they have separate units, that they may retreat into Austria where there's a, a myth that they have these fortresses there and that they're gonna hide out and practice guerrilla warfare and hang on for the next several years. So General Eisenhower hears about this. So he decides I'm gonna divert some American troops to Austria. Now, Captain Wimmer, the commandant of the prison, he has orders to kill the prisoners now that Germany knows they're gonna lose the war. But he says to the prisoners, I'm not going to kill you. Anybody want to guess why he's told the prisoners he's not going to kill them? The real reason is he doesn't want to be labeled a war criminal. The truth is he's already a war criminal. He's killed thousands of people on the Eastern Front. But maybe he figures they haven't heard about that. But if I'm nice to the French here, when the war is over, they'll tell him what a nice guy I am. So he assures them, you're not going to be killed by me. Now, on April 29th, the Dachau commandant, Edwin Vida, he deserts the camp. Before he leaves Dachau, he kills 2,000 prisoners, okay? 2,000 people in the, in the prison camp. He goes to Castle Ida, and he gets there the next day. But on May 2nd, he decides to commit suicide. At this point, Bimmer says, you know what? That's my boss. He's killed himself. I'm out of here. So he takes his wife and family who've been living in the castle with him, and he tells all the security force, you're on your own. Get out of here. So he leaves the, the castle in the hands of the prisoners. So it's May 3rd, 1945, and the region around the castle, though, is still firmly in the hands of SS troops, in particular, the 17th Panzer Grenadier Division. All right? And they have orders to kill all the prisoners. So what are the prisoners to do? Well, at this point, they said, maybe we can get some help. 
So they give a letter to Kukovic, the tradesman. It's written in English. Kukovic steals a bicycle and he goes riding in the countryside hoping to locate some American units because remember they had that shortwave radio and they've been listening to the BBC and they're getting more reports that the allies are closing in on Germany. And they figure maybe there's some allied troops nearby. So he finds an advanced unit of the Americans and he passes the word up the chain. However, a day later on May 4th, prisoners are kind of nervous. So they send out the castle cook to look for help. And he finds Major Gangle, who, as I said, is now working for the Austrian resistance. Now, Gangle has 20 men under his command. They've all changed sides. They've listened to him. They agree that they're not going to fight for Germany anymore. So he's got two vehicles. He piles all his men into the vehicles. And he says, we're going to go look for some Americans. Well, at the village of Kufstein, about 14 miles away from the castle, Gangle, under a white flag, is taken to one of the American headquarters. And the commander there says, you know what? I'll launch a task force to relieve the castle. So Lieutenant Lee is selected to lead the task force, but he's not given a lot of equipment and manpower. He has two Sherman tanks. One is called the Satwajeni, and the other is called Boschbuster. They have four-man groups. He gets six African-American infantrymen, and he's told he can take Major Gangle and his 20 German soldiers. But they're not really soldiers. They're, they're mechanics. They, they're used to working on equipment. But that turns out to be very valuable because they come to a bridge that's near the castle, and it's armed with explosives. And Gangle's men are able to defuse the explosives. My time up? No. <laughs> Somebody did. <laughs> okay. Now, Boschbuster, the second tank, Lieutenant Lee says, You stay at the bridge, you protect your way back once we uh, rescue the, uh, the prisoners. So, under Harry Bassey, he stays at the bridge to guard the way back. Now, the task force gets close to the castle. But there are some SS in the way. However, Lee gets Besat and Jimmy and his men through, and Gangle's men through to the castle, and they go to the front gate. Now, at this point, the prisoners, they've been left alone. The Germans left everything when they left, including the weapons. So they break into the armory and they arm themselves with pistols and rifles. Now, Prior to Lee's arrival, there was a convalescing German SS officer who was staying there. And he actually befriends the French prisoners. And they ask him if he would stay and help come up with a plan to defend the castle. And he says, yes, he will. Probably for the same reason that Wimmer was nice to the prisoners in the end. He didn't want to be labeled a war criminal because he's a member of the SS. Now, the prisoners are happy when Lee shows up, but it's like, where's the rest of the gang? There's not enough of you here. Well, the prisoners are angry because Lee says, we're not going anywhere. We're staying here. We're going to wait for help. My men are tired and hungry. Interesting, in his memoirs, Renaud, the former uh, uh, prime minister, he says Lee is uh, crude in both looks and manners. And adds, if Lee is a reflection of America's policies, Europe is in her heart. <laughs> He's talking about the guy who's going to rescue him. <laughs> Ungrateful French, that's all. <laughs> now, Lee at this point gets with Schrader and he says, we've got to come up with a plan. So he puts Passat and Jenny, his tank, to guard the main gate. Okay? And then he tells his men, eat and get some rest. Meanwhile, Lee and Schrader discuss a defensive strategy. And they say, you know what? We'll put our soldiers up in the higher towers of the castle. They can look out, and if we're attacked, we can fire from there. Now, about May 4th at 11 p.m., the battle begins. And it begins when the Germans in the countryside around the castle start firing machine gun fire at the castle. But what's a castle made of in those days? Stone. It's really not doing any damage but it's creating a psychological impact on, on uh, the prisoners. Now, Lee and Gangle's men return fire. They've got pistols and rifles. They're not gonna do any damage, but they're letting the SS know, we're not gonna give in. You're gonna have to take us. So 
the Germans get serious at this point. On the morning of the 5th, they roll in an 88 millimeter anti-tank gun. And that's going to do some damage. And the first thing they go after is the tank, Sat J. And they hit it and they put it out of commission. Now, the good news is, even though the Sat Jenny is, is out, of, out of commission, the four soldiers inside are okay. They get inside the castle. Now, about 150 to 200 SS troops begin moving towards the castle. At this point, the French prisoners who've been told by Lee, go hide in the basement, four of them turn around and said, you know what? We're gonna pick up a weapon and we're gonna fight. So Renault, Clemenceau, Larat, and Baratra come out of the basement, they pick up weapons and they start to man the walls. Now, Gangle, believe it or not, he has contacts in the local uh, Austrian resistance and the telephone system is working. So he puts a call out and he calls the Austrian resistance. But all he gets is two Wehrmacht soldiers who are willing to switch sides and a 14 year old boy. Not a lot of help, okay? but it's something. Now, Kukovic, that tradesman, he's still riding around on his bicycle. He's looking for more help. And he finds Major John Kramers of the 103rd Division. And Kramers puts together a plan to relieve the castle. He's got a little bit more equipment. He's got four mechanized tank destroyers, three Jeeps, and a truck with a platoon of men, about 30 soldiers. Okay, Not overly large, but certainly more than what Lee took with him. All right, Kramer's force heads towards the castle, but they encounter our artillery barrage, but they still press on. Now, the task force reaches the bridge where Boschbuster, the other tank, has been standing by. And they join up together and they run into some other American forces. So the task force is growing larger by the minute, but they're still several miles from the castle. Now, at this point, the SS machine guns, they've been penetrating the windows and they've been doing some damage uh, with the cannon. And uh, you can see there's some holes in the castle. So it's definitely uh, suffering some, uh, some damage. And unfortunately, while he's trying to pinpoint the location of that anti-tank gun, Gangle is shot in the head by a sniper and is killed. Four of Gangle's men are also wounded, but no Americans are hurt at this point. Now, with the local resistance, Kramers is able to call the castle. The phone rings at the castle, Lee picks it up, and the voice on the other end says, the warranty on your tank is about to expire. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It's Kramer saying, Lee, hang on. We're almost there. Okay. We're, we're, we're on our way. But Lee, he's smart. He says, you know what? I got to have a plan B. So I'm going to make a worst case scenario plan. And that plan is he tells all the defenders, we're going to make our way up to the tallest tower in the castle. We will expend all our ammunition. We'll use bayonets. We'll fight hand to hand. We're going to let the SS know they're going to have to fight for every step to take over this castle and capture and kill these prisoners. So Lee puts his plan into action. He starts telling some of the folks, get to the highest tower, get the prisoners up there. All right. That's the safest place we can be. Well, at this point, the tennis star Baratra, you know, he's always been exercising. He's still in good shape. He says to Lee, why don't I try to run for help? Let me go over the wall and see if I can locate Kramers. Lee figures, what's one guy in his defense at this point? So if you want to take a shot at it, go ahead. So Baratra escapes from the castle. Now, he finds Major Kramers. And he tells Kramers what's going on. And he says, I will guide you to the castle. But... I want a weapon and I want an American army uniform. I want to fight alongside you. Kramers agrees. About four o'clock, the SS is close to the front gate. They've got explosives. They plan to blow it up, get inside the castle and kill all the prisoners. However, the tactical situation has changed because now there is gunfire coming from behind the German SS troops. One of the Wehrmacht soldiers is up in the tower, shouts out, Amerikanisch Panzer, meaning American tanks. Led by Boschbuster, 
and the rest of the task force, they capture 100 SS prisoners and they scatter the rest into the countryside. For all purposes, the Battle of Casalida, though short, is over. The Boschbuster crew finds their boss, Lieutenant Lee, walks up to him. Lee looks him in the eye and says, what kept you? And they all laugh. Now, in the aftermath of the battle, the French prisoners are transported back to Innsbruck, Austria for debriefing. The Americans return to the units. And Gangle's men, well, they are sent to a POW camp. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Now, after the war, what happens to these folks? Well, one of the prime minister, Dalladay, returns to French politics, lives till age 86 and dies in 1970. You're gonna find a common thread here as a lot of these folks lived a long life. General Gamlin writes his memoirs, but he focuses on his World War I service because he didn't do a damn thing in World War II. <laughs> he surrendered the French army very quickly, okay? The labor leader, Jehu, he married his mistress, he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize in, in 1951, uh, but he died a couple of years later. Another former Prime Minister, Renault, returned to politics, lived until 1966, died in 89. The tennis star, Baraka, went back to the sport, became a player and an ambassador for the sport, and lived until age 95. General Wigand was held as a collaborator until 1946, but he was cleared in 1948 lived until 1965, 98 years old. Clemenceau, the son of the World War I prime minister, tried politics, didn't like it, went to private sector. De La Rock, the right-wing political leader, tried to rehabilitate his reputation before he died in 46. The sister of Charles de Gaulle, recognized her service for French resistance, died in 1982 at the age of 93. Zivonimir Kukovic, the tradesman, probably the unsung hero of this whole epic, all right. He returns to Belgrade, opens up an electronic, uh, electric contracting firm, and gives his notes to the French and West German governments. And it's written about uh, in several books. Now, as far as the Nazi officers, well, Wimmer, <clears throat> the commandant, is captured after the war, and he is considered a war criminal. But for some reason, the French release him in 1949. But a couple of years later, he commits suicide. Stefan. The chief interrog interrogator, he's a suspected war criminal, but nobody can find him. Perhaps he ended up in South America, somehow escaped. Traitor, the SS officer who stayed at the castle, okay? The French were real nice to him. They signed a letter saying, yeah, he was here. They never gave him really a lot of credit for what he did. So he spent some time in a POW camp, but uh, he was released <clears throat> and he got a government job and uh, lived a normal life until 1990. Now, Kramers, who led the second relief force, he remained in the army, he was promoted up to full colonel, had a great career. The six African-American soldiers were told they would receive decorations for their bravery. They never got them. Okay, that was not uncommon. Racism was, was paramount in the uh, military during World War II. Uh, all left the service after the war. The two tank crews all survived the war and left it. I left the service. Harry Bassey, he probably made out better than anybody. Commander Boschbuster, he went into farming near Anaheim, California. He got an offer for some of his land. It came from a guy by the name of Walt Disney. <laughs> so he kind of gave up some of his farming and lived a nice life. As far as the unlikely allies, well, we know that Major Gangle was killed during the battle. But he's considered a national hero in Austria for his work with the, with the Austrian resistance and for helping to defend the castle and save the lives of the French prisoners. And there's a monument built in his honor. Now, I wish I could tell you there was a happy ending for Lieutenant, now Captain John Lee. He was promoted, he was, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, which is one step below the Congressional Medal of Honor. After the war, he wanted to play professional football. He didn't make it in the National Football League. He played some semi-pro ball, but then he went into the hospitality industry, became an alcoholic, had two failed marriages, was married a third time, and in 1973, just before his death at the early age of 54, he was interviewed for a magazine, and his comment about the battle was, 
Well, it was just the damnedest thing. <laughs> Somehow I'm wondering why Tom Hanks and 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 Spiegel haven't made a movie about this. I, I really, really can't figure it out. But believe it or not, it happened again. The American Germans fought on the same side once more because in the Czech Republic in 45, the US reconnaissance unit joined forces with more German Wehrmacht soldiers, Russian Cossacks, okay, and some allied POWs, and they saved the famous Spanish riding school looking center horses from two Soviet attacks that would have turned those horses into rations, <laughs> rations for the Russian army or hamburgers for the <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before I close out, believe it or not, a couple of months ago when I was doing research for this, I actually found this on the internet. There is actually a board game called oh. Castle Ida. Uh -huh. <laughs> it can be played solo or against somebody, but I always feel like if I played against somebody, who gets to be the SS? Do <laughs> <laughs> you really want to say, hey, the SS wins this battle? But I, I actually went through the whole scenario. I successfully defended the castle, but I wasn't as good as the defenders. I, I did lose four soldiers along the way. But it's a very interesting thing. It takes about an hour and a half to play. And you really have to do some strategy where to place your, your soldiers and, and try to suppress the enemy fire and stuff. And it, it helped me to learn a lot about the battle itself. So that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I do really appreciate it. I, I do so enjoy these. I, as I was telling one of the uh, members uh, this morning, Dale, that uh, the type of presentations I do are not just you know over over thirty thousand feet things. I like to focus in on the personalities of people and tell the stories of what individuals do. Because as as one of the the admirals I think during World War II had commented during the Battle of, of Midway when those pilots were going off the planes and not coming back, he said, where do we find such men? And, and throughout the history of the United States military and today it's men and women. And I'm very proud of the fact my wife is career Air Force as well, that we have such tremendous men and women that are willing to, to put their lives on the line and do things that the general public never really hears about, but they do it because they have to. And, and several years ago on the anniversary of Normandy, I uh, listened to a historian talk about uh, the American Fighting, fighting man. And the question he was asked was, why were they so successful? In World War II, what was going on just before World War II, the Depression, right? And many of our young men that fought in the military had nothing. Life was very, very difficult. So when World War II came along, they were survivors. They knew how to, you know, solve problems and, and, and do the impossible because they had been doing that their young adult lives. So. Again, I thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. Why did they think it was so important to make that castle and whether they could some limited resources and more there? Revenge. Uh, just revenge. That's just the yes, you know, the SS and the fanatics of Hitler that that you know, if they were gonna lose, they were gonna take everybody down that they could, is is what it came down to. But there were so few people there, and it's such a hard target to hit. It seems like there been a lot of others that were killed before the end of the war. But but these were the you know the highest some of the highest people in the French government and and so it was just you know just pure hatred I mean the SS I said Vimmer was a guy on the Eastern Front when he would follow the armies with just anybody left behind that wasn't killed in the battle he he killed them all yes sir uh, do you recommend the book about Stephen Harding uh, is it the last battle yeah As, yes I've read that book uh, the last battle uh, by Stephen Harding it, that's where I get a lot of my information from. Uh, was that, that that's when I read that book, that's when I said, you know what, this would be a great story to tell, you know, because it's just so unique. And like I, I said, I, I can't believe Spiegel and, and Hanks haven't got together. And, you know, Hanks is getting a little old, but I guess if you put a little dye in his hair, he could probably play <laughs> Lieutenant, <laughs> Lieutenant Lee or something like that, you know, or maybe, maybe Major Kramer's in a cam cameo appearance, you know, being a little bit older. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can win lots of dollars. This is our point of work raffle. Okay, the last four numbers are four nine zero zero.
Is she in there? Is she yeah. there? She 